Well, I want to welcome all of you today to the Business and Leaders Luncheon. I'm very grateful that all of you took your time an hour and a half out of your busy day to come here and network with each other, but also listen to a very important um, candidate in a very important race. All the candidates are important. Whenever you step out and want to run for office, um, it's not easy. It, it doesn't matter what the polls look like or anything. It's not easy because you are out there exposed. And so we're really exposing yourself. But no, maybe I shouldn't say that. Could you rewind all of that stuff? <laughs> now that I have your attention. <laughs> Um, I'm Lynn Snodgrass. I'm the CEO of the Best Dog on Chamber in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm going to be the CEO for a couple more months. So thank you very much. And I want to thank the, our presenting sponsors, Columbia Bank, the Boeing Company, Portland General Electric, and Persimmon Country Club. Again, it feels like a broken record, but without sponsorships, we just can't do things. We need that support, that monetary support, but it also is a support from the company itself on what the chamber is, is doing. And I want to thank our stakeholder sponsor, which is Gresham Barlow School District and Metro East Community Media. Keith, thank you so much for making me look good and for rewinding that awful bad fupa earlier in the day. So thanks to all of our partners. We are recording today, which is why I asked him to do that rewind. We're recording today, so if you want to hear this the um, presentation again today, <clears throat> from today, you can go and um, these brochures are sitting on the registration table, but it's rebroadcast and then Keith also sends us a copy. So you, if you miss it on any of the network rebroadcasts, then you can come to the chamber website and look at this one or any of the previous ones. So you're welcome to do that and share it with your friends too. If you find something that was really interesting today, share your friends with your friends. I'd like to acknowledge our board members that are here today. The Government Affairs Chair um, Committee, uh, Chair of the Government Affairs Committee is Warner, Warner Allen of Warren Allen LLP. Warren, thank you very much for being here today. And I also ha would like to introduce Lisa Scari, who is the President of Mounted Community College and on our board as well. Lisa, thank you for being here. We have, um, some wannabe elected officials in the audience, which I'm not going to introduce, but you know who you are. But I do want to acknowledge Councillor Sue Piazza. Sue, thank you very much for being here. And there's a council meeting tonight, is that correct? Starts at six o'clock. Be there, be square. Yeah, be prepared, there you go. The Labor Commissioner is a very powerful position for business. Regulations, wage and hour issues, workforce development, all fall under Boley and the Commissioner, Bureau of Labor and Industries. That's the acronym. Boley is the acronym. Unfortunately, over the course of my personal uh, business owner time, the commissioners holding that role often forgot the industry side of the title, or at least that's how I felt. We expect our state government officials to be balanced when dealing with Oregonians, and we need a fair agency to be available for employees to file complaints and a fair agency for business solutions. As you know, both candidates for this position were invited two and a half months ago and agreed immediately to attend today. Last week, one of the candidates, Christina Stevenson, decided not to attend our forum. Her campaign gave the reason, and I quote, to not participate in debate or forum unless it's a neutral organization. Not sure what she means by neutral, but um, she had eliminated herself from not only our chamber event, but several chamber speaking opportunities. And I consider this to be a little bit of a last minute drop. It happened last week and it had been a two and a half month commitment. We're real, I am personally really sorry that she missed this opportunity because I think we've done an amazing job to be fair to all of the candidates, no matter what, to give them their chance to make their case to the audience and then to in the rebroadcast. So we're sorry that she's missing this opportunity to meet Gresham business leaders. We have Sherry Held here today with us though and she will speak in a few minutes and there'll also be a time for question and answer just like we always do. My business for 30 years plus was managing a garden center. To this day, I notice landscapes. I know some of you have some pretty awesome ones and some you need to go to our garden center. I notice and I have opinions about plants and people come and ask me for gardening advice. I 
can't help but be involved. It just comes natural. It just like it comes natural to some of you. Where's, where's Sue O'Halloran? Sue, it, it comes natural to Sue to help with, with prop, some property things. You just naturally draw into your experience and you want to offer help. Okay. If Christina were here today, she would tell her, she would tell you her story just like she told to me. She's a small business owner. She's an attorney. This has seven in her office. She's never belonged to a local chamber. When I asked her that question, she said no, she had never belonged to a local chamber, and a lot of attorneys don't belong to local chambers. She has spent her entire career as an attorney representing clients, suing businesses on behalf of her clients. Nothing wrong with that legal expertise. We need that legal expertise, but she definitely would come to the table with years of experience representing one side of the equation, its Bureau of Labor and Industries. It's unfortunate Christina chose not to attend today to tell you her story in person. But we are fortunate to have the other candidate for commissioner with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Sherry Hilt to come to the podium and give you her perspective on her life and what the job is. And remember, there'll be question and answer time afterwards. So Sherry, come on in. Thanks for being here. Applause, applause. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much, Lynn, and all of you from the chamber. I greatly appreciate it. I, grac grac I greatly appreciate the sponsorship from all the businesses to bring forward uh, this event. And it is so important that we have dialogue and that we are able to talk about issues and talk with each other. I think a lot of times we talk too much about polarization and how polarized our world is. And the reality is we cannot eliminate polarization without having conversations. And so that's why I am proud to be here and um, I'm proud to have a conversation with all of you. However, with that being said, I'm gonna start out by talking to you about myself, which is not my favorite part, because again, I like to have the dialogue. So I'll try to limit my um, comments and, and uh, leave more time for questions for all of you. So my name is Sherry Helt, and I have owned a small business in Bend for 18 years. Uh, my husband and I own a restaurant called Zydeco Kitchen and Cocktails. And at Zydeco Kitchen and Cocktails, we have um, 67 employees. Before the pandemic, we had 104 employees. And overnight, we were closed and went down to 12 employees and lost 90% of our sales. I think that is a very important story to tell, and I think that knowledge um, was probably one of the hardest things that I've earned in my life, right, is that learned experience. And I wanna bring that experience um, to a statewide office to make sure that we don't forget that experience, that we know what it's like to make sure um, that we're taking care of our employees. And when that happened, my husband and myself reached into our savings and put out $30,000 to pay for our employees' health insurance because we were closed down due to a pandemic and we could not think of, we were told it would be three months. We could not think of leaving our employees without health insurance during a health crisis. Um, and at that point I remember thinking, gosh, three months seems like a long time. <laughs> if only, right? If only. Um, so that's, that's um, a little bit about myself and my business experience. Um, I also have served on my school board, which I think is really important because the Bureau of Labor and Industry Commission position that I'm running for is a nonpartisan position. Um, school board is also nonpartisan. And so I served um, just around a decade um, on my school board. And school board is just such a great experience because you work with so many groups and you're able to do so many things. On my time as a school board member, we were able to raise graduation rates by 10%. And we also increased teacher salaries. Um, so bringing a fair and balanced approach to get the results that we needed, right? Um, and so that is um, a big component of who I am is working on the school board. Um, and um, then I went on um, to run for state uh, legislature and I served in the House of Representatives and represented Bend. 
And that was a really great experience. And that experience, um, I made some friends. And you might know a couple of them. Um, Senator Betsy Johnson and uh, Representative Christine Drazen. They've both endorsed my campaign. And I think that's really important because um, you know when people talk about politics, they'll talk about um, that it's hard to make friends. Well, I've made friends, and um, they've endorsed me, and I have maintained those friendships. And so that that's something that I'm very proud of as well. So why now, Bowley? Well, our small businesses have been hit particularly hard. And as a chamber member for the Ben Chamber of Commerce, I think it's really important that we have a small business voice. When I was in the legislature, I did not find enough small business owners making rules for small businesses. And um, as Lynn had said, that you know, small businesses really need representation. And in the Bureau of Labor and Industry, for all too long, it's been called the labor commissioner. And that's, that's not what it is. It's not the labor commissioner. And so I'm bringing forward an opportunity to create opportunities out of a statewide office. This office has 120 employees, and it also has a $35 million budget. With that budget, we can make sure to create opportunities. In this last session, we've seen a $120 million workforce package passed. Why did, why did the state of Oregon have to pass a workforce package for $120 million? Well, because our workforce in the trades and our hardworking um, Oregonians ha are aging out because people are not getting into these jobs. I think it's because we don't have leadership and leadership that has designed a vision for what our workforce looks like. So back to my school board days, when I was on the school board, we built a transparency dashboard. We wanted parents to know what the scores were in the schools, how their kids were doing. And we built this dashboard so that they could see all of the numbers. I want to take that experience and build a dashboard for Oregon on our workforce. I want to work with our chambers. I want to work with Oregon Business and Industry. I've already met with their CEO, Angela Wilhelms, and talked to her about this. And I want to build a dashboard that starts out with how many jobs there are in each sector, how much they pay, where do you get training? We need to take the mystery out of these high paying career jobs, right? And connect students and people that are transitioning in their jobs to the ability to connect with the career that they want. We can do this for the whole state and we can put it forward. I've already met with a company that does this. They design dashboards um, for the workforce. And I was like, that's great. Now we've got a public-private partnership that we could put forward um, as soon as I get into office. And so I think with an intentional workforce, we can address the labor shortage that we've all been experiencing. And I think we can really get our, our youth into careers immediately instead of having them come and work dishes for me for a couple of years before they figure out what they're doing. Now, nobody's allowed to tell my husband about that because I'll get in trouble for that. But I really think that our, our career and college centers are focusing more on college applications in our high schools. We passed Measure 98 to have dedicated career or career technical and education career and technical education inside of our high schools and when we did that we've never connected them with the career as much as we need to because we have not connected the jobs and the opportunities to the schools and so what i want to do is have a dedicated bridge that is um, funded through Boley to make sure that we are getting people to the jobs that they need and that our state needs. And that's how we're going to thrive and we're going to have a vision to move forward. Now, where we've seen this fall apart is in chip making. Um, we have had Intel not have the workforce they need, and so they've moved jobs over to Ohio because of the fact that we do not have the workforce for them. We don't have a bully apprenticeship. They've went to bully before and asked for an apprenticeship. We need to support Intel, but not only Intel, all of the chip makers in our state with an apprenticeship because those are the jobs for our future. When we build and lead, we need to lead for our future, not our past. And right now, we are not 
leading with a model that's successful. We have over 300 electrical uh, apprenticeships waiting to happen, but we can't because we have ratios that are artificially designed to inhibit the workforce to keep the wages driven up higher. Well, right now, I would argue that wages have never been higher, and neither has the demand for the electricians and the plumbers. And so that is an example of how we need to move those ratios around to get the workforce that we need and to design what Oregon needs and lead with a vision. And so that's the vision that I have, is really to bring forward the customer service that I have in my restaurant and then to build the workforce out through technology and utilize um, the resources that we've used in other areas and really bring those public-private partnerships forward. That's where we really have a lot of success. And this agency right now is a failed agency, and we can fix that rather quickly just by doing a few things that I've, I've spoken about. So that's about enough time of speaking um, at you, and now I'd like to uh, open it up for questions so I can hear what's on your mind. Because I think one of the most important things in, when you're in an elected position is being with people and listening to their concerns and answering um, what, what you all need. So thank you for listening, and I would love to hear what you have to say. A politician with few words. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a question? Come on. OK, Michael. Well, thank you for visiting us today. We really, really appreciate it. So um, I'm not sure whether this is in your bandwidth, but in, uh, in your life experience and business experience, where do you think the employees have gone? Uh, you know, we hear the unemployment rate's low, mm -hmm. and every small business that I meet with and talk to says we can't find employees. And so I haven't figured out where they went. Uh, and, and so could, could you explain to us in your your, your background of what you think is, and you've pro provided us with some solutions uh, mm -hmm. to that then too, but, but how do we get those people uh, connected with the businesses? So thank you for that question. I think that's really important. Um, one thing that I believe is that COVID was so hard on everybody because we don't like change, right? We like things to be stable and balanced. And COVID really tipped the scales on anything that was considered balanced. It changed everyone's life in their work and life circumstances, and so to different varying levels. But I think what happened is people that were getting closer to retirement but hadn't planned on retiring, retired early. And I think that's where we lost most of our workforce, is people that were close enough to retirement to think, oh, I have enough money to retire, and I'm, I'm not going to deal with this anymore. I'm just going to make my own destiny, and I'm going to step out of the workforce. I think that's our biggest opportunity as well. When we talk about building a workforce for the future, we need their wisdom. And unfortunately, we all know that interest rates are rising, um, inflation is high right now, and a lot of these people hadn't saved for their retirement, and now they're gonna find themselves in a space where maybe part-time could be good. Maybe they could come back part-time. Maybe they could be part of the training um, labor force to train the younger folks that are coming up into the jobs. And that's what I would like to do, is appeal to these people to help build the workforce. So for an example, we lost a lot of nurses. Yesterday I spoke with Asante Healthcare in Medford. And they are, I believe, 450 nurses short. Um, so they've had a lot of people retire and leave their workforce. But they have a lot of um, uh, more of the certified nurses, the CNEs. And so if you could bring back the RNs part time and start a bully apprenticeship program through maybe a community colleges, I see we have a community college administrator here, and bring back some um, of that workforce to train up the CNEs to get them into a registered nursing position. That way we could fill that backlog with a thoughtful dynamic that could meet everybody's needs. Because I think it's important to meet people where they are, right? So if they want to be retired, 
or not in full-time work, but maybe training would be something that would be appealing to them. I think we could really help move that dialogue and build that workforce with intention and then make sure that we have the care that we need for our state. Because I still can't figure out why we did not put a bully apprenticeship program in place over this past time frame when we were losing nurses the way we were. And they also need support because there's so many people, there's such a lack of labor force in that industry that bringing people in to support them, I think, will help build the workforce as well. I have a question. I don't know who you are. I'm Tom. Tom, nice to meet you, Tom. Here you go. Good to meet you too, Lynn. Thank you. Actually, I probably do know. We've met more than once, but that's okay. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, to the demographics, uh, this is not an area with which I have familiarity, but I'm aware that you go out and restaurants are closed on other nights of the week because they can't get staff. Do the demographics show that our workforce has gotten younger? In other words, if your position is that, that one of the reasons there aren't a lot of workers is because many of them retired early, mm -hmm. theoretically there are demographic reports that will show that yes, our workforce is younger. And, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if there are actual numbers to back that up. Yeah, so I met with the electricians, um, and I'll give you an example of the electricians. Um, their average age going into the pandemic of an electrician was, I believe, 56 and now it's down to 41. Um, so you've seen a lot of people leave the workforce and that it could be okay, right? If we're getting the numbers down lower because we don't really wanna be up in the high 50s for electricians, please, we need more. Um, I don't know if you, any of you have called an electrician lately, but it's a long wait, right? But what we need, so bringing the workforce uh, age down isn't necessarily bad, but it is bad because we're not bringing enough of the people in. And so there are those, those younger um, apprenticeships that are waiting. There's 300 of them in the open shop electrical shops, and I'm told 300 in the union shops as well. So that's 600 apprenticeships that we could get going and move that number of the average age down even further. Um, if we could get those 600 folks in apprenticeships and start their training and then also be building that workforce that we need for all of our businesses and homes as well. Okay, another question? Hi, Sherry. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, so Thank my you. question is going to be a little bit broad, so bear with me as I think through my thoughts and how to ask it. But it really correlates to individuals getting into the workforce and now they have to go to school and building up a huge educational debt of not only time but financing, mm -hmm. we know that. So my concern was myself, obviously having a master's degree, huge bills, what are we seeing to kind of you know, make that gap tinier so people are not so scared to get into programs, maybe again apprenticeships for mm -hmm. multiple things, not just our plumbing or construction work, but what's going on where children or younger people can come into something and think, okay, I'm not going to be $500,000 in debt and have mm -hmm. that stress going forward. That itself would help with our labor. And I know that high school programs are starting programs like what you were speaking about earlier, but when kids graduate high school, they already have an associate's degree maybe. Mm -hmm. So there's that piece. But is there anything more further being helped with baccalaureate programs or master's programs where there are other apprenticeship options? Yeah, so I think we have to really be intentional about the workforce that we want. 40% of people go to college, and that's great. Um, and then we have the 60% that don't. And that's really where the Bureau of Labor and Industry focuses for its apprenticeship programs. And that's where we can use that for $35 million to make sure that we're developing what we need. And so that's why it's important to go to all the businesses and listen to what the jobs are, where they are, how long it takes to train them, how much it costs, how much those jobs pay, and put that on a dashboard so that kids can see exactly where the opportunities are and what they would like. And so, you know, I use the example of chip making. That's a $135,000 a year. That's a pretty good job and we could really capture a lot of those uh, that workforce and 
if you think about it, there's a $280 billion investment from the United States government right now that is out there for all the states to apply for. And in, in my mind, I always want more than our fair share, right? Because we've been the leading chip maker in the nation for many, many years. So that money we should be utilizing to work with people like Jessica Gomez down in Medford and her small chip making business to make sure that when she expands out, she expands out here. But if she's going to expand out here, we've got to make sure that we have an apprenticeship and that we're working with our community colleges and we're really building a solid partnership. And that really hasn't, work has not been led. Um, you know, the commissioners have not really focused on that. We have continued the same type of apprenticeship program, you know, time and time and time again. And where that's really important is my opponent is endorsed by all those four commissioners. We don't want more of the same. We cannot have more of the status quo. We really have to have leadership that is building with intention and doing exactly what you're saying because with the price of college going so high, it's going to price out more kids that are going to you know, look at that for their future. But we can also really have great careers and build them through workforce and we have to really talk to our kids a little bit about you know sweat not a bad thing working with your hands not a bad thing and electricians that's a six-figure job right now and these are not low-wage jobs these are really great jobs and so what really needs to happen is we need to change the conversations from the career and technical education centers to say hey what future are you looking for because these are futures that can really build a nice living and a living wage um, and so the more we talk about careers the more we get um, education paired with you know our our trades and other opportunities the the less we have to talk about minimum wage the less we have to worry about labor shortages because we will have the the trained workforce and we just need to take the mystery out of it and i don't think it's hard to do it i don't think it's expensive either because we have so much knowledge and technology at this point that we can connect all of those dots for our youth and we've seen the ACT scores. The pandemic was really hard on these kids. I mean, if ever there was a time that we need change, it's right now because our kids are hurting. They were left behind for two years and we can really move these apprenticeships in a way that's thoughtful, works with our community colleges, works with our high schools and, and builds our workforce. Sherry, Karen's got a question. Of course. Hi there. Um, so my question is about these apprenticeship programs and how are you going to um, facilitate those and market those to the schools? Because I think the high schools, possibly middle schools, that's where it needs to start yeah. to get them all thinking about it. And you're right. The, the career centers are all about, you know, applying for scholarships and going to college. And so how, how are we gonna get that there? And do we need skill centers? It's so expensive to put CTE in every high school. They all need it. But to get, um, you know, if you do skilled centers, you are feeding from several school districts and it's a lot less expensive and it's easier to get trainers because you don't need as many okay so can you ask me that first part again because I'm I got excited about the second part <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was about how are you going to facilitate these oh, apprenticeship yeah. programs and um, market them so the marketing really is going to happen by talking with all of you and and putting out surveys to figure out where those jobs are, how many jobs there are, and place them on a map so that kids can look at what they want. And then it comes from, so I was also, which I didn't mention, I was on the Oregon School Boards Association board for six years. And so I've worked with people all across the state. And 
it's really important um, that we take that career and technical education program that we work so hard to build and get into all of our schools, that inside those programs we're talking about, you're not just building a cabinet, but why don't we have the jobs that are connected to the cabinets and to the woodworking be brought up during those classes? And that's not what we have right now. So we really need to focus on, we're, we're doing a lot more on the technical part than the career part, right? And so we need to work with those school districts. But I have relationships with so many school board members across our state at the community college level as well as high school level and that's where we need to be focused and that's why I'm ready to go on day one because I have those relationships but also we need to look towards Wisconsin and North Carolina because they're doing youth apprenticeship programs to the tune of 20,000 apprenticeship programs for our youth and so if we could really change those career and technical education programs more to be Per, more prescriptive on the career side of it, we could get results better and quicker and faster. And so in, um, in Oregon, we have two youth apprenticeship programs, two, um, that I'm aware of. One is an, a pre-electrician program out in um, Morrow County, and then there is one in Beaverton that is um, around chip making. Both of those programs have 12 students in them. What? We are so far behind. We have to have leadership that has intention and purpose and drives results. So the second part of your question is, I went out to Baker City, and Baker City has Baker Technical Institute. And Baker Technical Institute does just what you're talking about. And that's what I want to also do for our rural communities, as well as being fiscally prudent, because I am very fiscally prudent. And I think it's important to get the most for your dollar. They put on for heavy equipment drivers for the training. They have CAT simulators, right? And so you can learn to drive these the heavy equipment. It is on trailers and they trailer it around the state because it's a $500,000 investment. So why just put it in one school? Why not be sending it to multiple schools to get more investment across our state and get better results? Because we can do that. We can think outside of the box. We don't have to live inside of brick and mortar when we're building apprenticeships and programs. And we, we should absolutely encourage that from a school level. And we can encourage that. And I can make sure that happens from a, a Bureau of Labor and Industry standpoint. So Sherry, we have Brandon, then Sue, and then John. OK, I'll go faster. Yeah. <laughs> I love this. This is like such an engaged conversation. Yeah, actually, uh, just, a, just as a side note, so I, um, I'm a, somewhat of an outsider, but I've lived in uh, several different states and worked with uh, John Deere, my company, for a while. So we do have, I've ha helped out with our apprenticeship programs with the states mm -hmm. of Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri. So if you need any more contacts to Yeah, I need your, your card. Mark, for sure, definitely <laughs> my card. But my question is, uh, in coming here, you know, I've sat down with my employees. We've had a lot of turnover. We try to, you know, figure out, you know, what will help us get good candidates. And I talk to them about what their concerns are. And at least for my employees, uh, what I've heard is public safety, mm -hmm. uh, transportation, as far as being able to even try to get to work on time for those that either have to rely on public transit or they live so far out because they can't afford anything anywhere near where we, mm -hmm. where we operate. You know, it just takes them a while to get in. They spend a lot of their time commuting. And then the third thing is around housing. And so I you know it's not mm -hmm. as much probably we can do about that. But, you know, do you have any plans on working with other, you know, local or government agencies uh, to kind of address those types of issues as they affect, you know, our labor and just the appeal of uh, labor in this area? Thank you for that question, Brandon. Um, I'm going to talk about workforce housing. Um, when I did my Oregonian interview, I did not get endorsed by the Oregonian. They said it was because I was expanding the office um, for workforce housing. I was very frustrated by that. I was frustrated by that because workforce housing is directly tied to Boley. 
We have 111,000 homes that were short in our state, and that's one of our bigger inhibitors for our workforce. Um, these are workforce houses, 111 that were short. One of the reasons that we are short these houses is because we don't have enough apprenticeships and electricians and plumbers. I mean, everybody in this room knows this, right? Because when you try and call an electrician or a plumber, you don't get one for a few months, right? Um, we need to expand out the apprenticeships in these areas to get the workforce housing, to increase the supply, to bring down the cost, to make sure that we have a livable and workable state. And this starts in Boley. This is one of the most important missions that this office should be focused on, in my opinion. And right now, the Bureau of Labor and Industry does not divulge how many apprenticeships are even done through Boley. That, that's nowhere. So I spoke with the state economist and I said, how many, how many apprenticeships do you need to fill this void of affordable workforce housing? And he told me six to 7,000. So we need six to 7,000 construction work apprenticeships um, and plumbers and electricians to be able to do this. It's a workforce we need of 13,000 to address the housing shortage, where I know a few of you are in the city council, uh, city councils and applying for city council positions. There's four to 600 positions that need to be filled for permits to be able to excel the permits to be able to work, build the workforce housing. Now that I can't do with Boley, but I can't communicate to all of you that are in charge of that. But what Boley needs to do for exactly what you're talking about, because that is real. It's real that we have such expensive homes. Where I live in Bend, 9% of the workforce, nine, the entire workforce can afford to live there. Our median home price is $760,000. We've priced everybody out. We cannot continue in that way, but it starts, one of the biggest pieces is with Boley. Now, make sure that you are, you know, when you're marking the rest of your ballot, that you're marking for people that will help with land use and other issues that are very pertinent to workforce housing. But you can't build the houses without certified people that have to come through the Boley apprenticeship program. So I think it's very important. Um, and I'm in complete disagreement with the Oregonian on their view. <laughs> okay, Sue? Yeah. <laughs> well, indeed, um, home builders, I believe, and I know for sure that Oregon realtors are supporting you and your candidacy, and, and particularly on that issue. Housing is just critical for this state. Mm -hmm. um, but actually what I wanted to talk about was the relationship with community colleges. You just kind of only touched on that briefly. But workforce is, in our area, something that's a really big topic, and that topic is with our community college. Mm -hmm. And um, historically here in Oregon, we have continually underfunded our community colleges. And so I want to call that your attention because if you have any degrees of influence, that is a critical piece, I think, of also solving you know, that there are resources for students and people mm -hmm. coming back into the workforce. But I really would like you to talk a little bit about more the relationship of what community colleges, because in some cases, would it not be more efficient to work with them as opposed to set up new interskill or skill facilities? Yes, so you are absolutely right. Um, on many points, I am supported by the realtors, the farmers, um, the home builders, many, many different um, folks that I'm proud to be endorsed by. Um, I was the vice chair of education when I served in the House of Representatives. And I worked a lot with community colleges. And I think that they are one of the most important pieces. Our funding, I believe, at this point, is 5% of our state, of their budgets, is funded by our state. It's really, really incredibly low. And as I think it's very, very important, um, 
community college enrollments kind of follow the cycle of recession and um, good economy because when the economy is good there's lots of jobs so people don't go back for training right but as we go into a, a place that could be a recession um, and is predicted to be it's going to be so important to have someone leading this position that can work to get the training built up and that's what we need to do is scale it up immediately and we need to build that those conversations with the k-12 and the community colleges and the apprenticeship programs. So it needs to be a three-legged stool, and we need to have all the legs in place, right? Because if we have one of them missing, it doesn't work. And so we need the communication at the high school level in those career centers that says, hey, if you're looking for this, here's your training. This is going to be in your community college. This is a short amount of time. It's a short money commitment. It's a big payoff for you. The return on investment is great. Um, and that's how we build our workforce, is by making sure that all three of those legs of that stool are together. And um, never forget about the community colleges. I, um, My community college, I put um, our president on my Red Cross board because I like to have my community colleges close. <laughs> Sherry, John has had a question. This will kind of reinforce what you said there, but you know, Oregon's an interesting place, right? Because you have to look at it in perspective as far as you know where, where Oregon is built, right? We come from timber, fishing, ranching, farming. Mm -hmm. Great places, great industries, but they're mm -hmm. all in severe decline. And last I checked, nobody goes to college to learn that stuff. It's family, kind of moves forward. You learn on the mm -hmm. job, right? It's training. It's like trades. Mm -hmm. So same idea goes as we start to grow up, right? We, I mean, let's face it, most cities, or most states, rather, have a, a one city in their state that has more people in it than our entire state. So we, we have to look at as we grow up into this chip making and these different mm -hmm. technology, bringing new infrastructure here. Yeah, it, it, you know, the tax breaks are what lures them here, but you're correct. If they don't see the workers, they're going to go somewhere else. Yep. And so what are we doing to train? Because it is, you're right, the trifecta of like the community colleges and the unions and then Boley, you're talking to industry, you know, kind of collaborating to give those industries or this infrastructure the incentive or attract them here to not only come here, but to stay here. So mm -hmm. what are we doing? I mean, who's flipping the bill, for example, for the training at the community college? You know, what are the unions doing? Is it a four-year program already established, or they need to establish one? I mean, it's alarming to me that they have that IT or chip, and there's only 12 students. That's absurd to me, hello. Um, you know, so what are we doing to create that now? Like, what are, what's the status of where we're at? And then what is the plan or strategic plan to move forward to get us to have the surplus of workers to fill the voids we already have and attract more infrastructure here? Well, I'm going to alarm you more. So we only have the 12 apprenticeships that are at the high school level. We don't even have one for adults. We have zero. So sorry to send your alarm bells the wrong way. The strategy is literally to get the leadership in this office that we need and that would be to vote for me we have to have someone that's willing to take this on and connect the dots we can't have people that are in office that are or people we have to have people in office that are and people we have to have people that work together because if we only focus on one thing if we only focus out of this office on labor we're where we are today we have to be able to inc include the community colleges. We have to be able to include the high schools. We have to be able to include the small business owners, the large business owners. We have to build the workforce that we need and deserve. And you know, timber industry is one that I'm gonna disagree with you a little bit on. It's a little bit, it's in major decline, but our fires are not declining because we're not managing our forests enough. And so we need to be thinning those forests. Um, and so we need to make sure that we have people in those careers because we cannot afford to have our forests keep burning. It's a resource that we can use. We can use that resource to build our affordable housing that we need. When we're 111,000 homes short, look, out, look outside that window. We've got a lot of trees that can help us build those homes. <laughs> We have. <clears throat> yeah. It's mostly 
really the same as the farming, though. The folks that are generational loggers, the kids are now seeing that there's no, there's no uh, future, so they're going to college. They're stuck. Mm -hmm. They're not doing it anymore. Well, we don't want kids not to go to college. Right. We want that 40% to go to college, and we want them to be successful. We just have to focus on the other 60%. But we need a training program for that 60%. That's yep. key. Lots of training programs, lots of options. And what we don't have is options inside a bully that are geared towards our future. And we have to gear our workforce towards our future. And this is the spot where we have $35 million that are designated to do that. And it hasn't been done. And I'm here to change that. So we have Anna. We have Anna, then Chad, then Kathy. And then Lisa. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, so I just, this is an aside. Um, I would encourage you to connect to the five Job Corps centers in this state. For too long, Job Corps has been separate mm -hmm. from the state and um, because it's a federal program, but the majority of students served at Job Corps centers are state students. They are staying in Oregon and um, taking the skills and the trades that they're learning and staying here in Oregon. So you mentioned mm -hmm. 12 pre-apprentice electricians, I think. There are more pre-apprentice students at the Tongue Point Job Corps Center right yeah. now than 12. Okay. So it's important for, um, for us to make that connection. I'm sorry, I come from Job Corps, so it's very important to me. I um, really like that. Thanks for yes, bringing yes, that. Yes, I did. Um, How so many Job Corps um, younger students do we have in electricians? When I last left Tongue Point, it was at least 12. I don't know what it is currently right now. Okay, so they're building up after the pandemic. Okay, so, it's so we'll not. go with 24. Okay. Um, so I my, stand corrected. There are 24. My question is actually about the training programs and the industry side of things. So um, I worked in workforce and employment development. I currently work in workforce developments for the city of Gresham. It's our teachers at our high schools and in our CTE programs at the high schools are running ragged trying to attract employers. And every once in a while you'll get an employer that says, yeah, I'm interested in, in working with you to get a pipeline set up. How are you going to incentivize those, or, those companies, those big employers, to step into the breach instead mm -hmm. themselves and, and step up and say, how can we make this work? Well, that's going to be the conversation, right? So when we have the conversation about building the dashboard, um, we're going to have to really have intentional um, you know, youth apprenticeships. So how many youth apprenticeship programs do you have and can you do? And we can add that piece, right? So that can be a piece that we start out with, not only the job that's the career, but the training piece that's available and accessible. And I just want to say thank you for your work because it is so important and it is a difficult job to be able to connect um, small businesses and um, our youth because our small businesses, especially in the last three years, have been just, you know, overwhelmed and not had the resources that they need. And so I think that we just have to keep moving the numbers. I want the numbers to be more like 20,000 because we can do 20,000. We have 460,000 students. Um, in our schools in Oregon. So we've got to move those numbers and that's where we get those connections is really prioritizing it and putting someone that's a paid person behind it. Okay, Chad. I, I understand the need for apprenticeships and maybe even having separate centers and stuff and using community colleges and stuff in, in some areas. But I also think there might be a connection that can be made where there can be an incentive or a connection to corporations. I mean, if you think of like a, a large electrician company, if they put together a training program and brought people in mm -hmm. to that, then you're not having to build a lot of schools and then you can have a training program that actually builds the pipeline and that person just stays in that pipeline. It's, they're there forever. Um, if it's an apprenticeship program at um, an auto shop or mm -hmm. something, the same kind of thing. You bring them in and then it's on the job training, paid training while you're doing the apprenticeship, learning, growing, building, work ethic, 
and there can be a match system that maybe the government can help you know, supply some of the dollars, some of the equipment that's necessary, the extra time, maybe the materials, things like that. I think that could speed up the growth and then, you know, it's connected. Yeah. No, that was, I guess I didn't have a question. Well, or have you thought of that? I guess, yes. let me end with the question. Have you thought of something like that? This is Q&A, not A&A. &A. <laughs> yeah. We do have apprenticeship programs here, um, and we have um, open shop apprenticeships, and we have union apprenticeships, and we also have some on-the-job training um, opportunities in different careers, um, and so those are all, all important. And what I would say from my 10 years of being on the school board is the more options you have, the more success you have, because we know that we don't want to make um, too many round holes for square pegs, right? And so we have to make sure that we have opportunities. And so the whole thing that I'd like you to take away from, from my vision is that I want to create opportunities for the future of Oregon for our workforce so that we are relevant and we are ready to go in the next career pass like the chip making because we sat and watched where we are losing that industry and we should not be because we're not, we do not have a bully apprenticeship for that program and we need to and we need to make sure we have on the job training um, as well because some of that's a little bit more nimble and, um, and then also the community college piece. So you have certificate programs, you have on the job training and you have apprenticeships and with all of that together, to your point, you get success. All right, we've got time for two more questions and then Sherry, yeah. Uh, don't worry, Lisa. You're my board member. I'm going to my boss, so don't. I'm not forgetting you. Um, we also want to give Sherry a time to, to do a wrap up and to do her campaign one minute ending too. So, Kathy, what an important meeting to be here to understand what Bowley can and has not been doing, and particularly with the businesses that the city of Gresham's been trying to get involved with. They've just been so underwater, they couldn't even begin to think of how they implement an internship. So thank you for bring, bringing that. My question is, um, I've heard the word silos used before, and you've spoken a lot about being on the school board, about the schools and the high schools, mm -hmm. but we, they are so directed by the Oregon Department of Education, and it seems a big miss for Measure 98 to say, let's go get these CTEs involved, and we're putting a lot of money behind them, but we're not going to have any uh, evaluation as to how they worked, right? It's like a dead end. Do that and see what happens. So what would you do to try to build that connection from Department of Education money to now what we can do in the industry for businesses? Thank you, um, and thanks for having me. This is a great conversation. This is like the most engaged audience I think I've spoke to uh, since I've been running, so this is really awesome. Thank you. I'm paying everybody for questions, so. <laughs> Thank it's, you. It's a capital, capital program here. Awesome, I like this program. We should replicate it. Um, so the career and technical education funding was secured and one of the reasons I believe that we don't have the workforce we need is our education funding got so tight and what people did was eliminate the career and technical education programs. And so they kept with the reading and the math and it was boring for kids and we lost kids, they dropped out and when we got the funding we were able to bring them back in. Um, and it also had workforce consequences, right? Because people weren't working with their hands in school so they didn't think that those were opportunities. So now we've got that back in place. Now we just need to really talk about what it means. And there are great programs across the state that really are connected. There's one in Prineville um, that I would illustrate that is working on mechanics um, because we don't have a lot of mechanics. I mean, if you've tried to make an appointment for your car, um, it might be a long time. So we need to make sure that we're getting kids in those programs as well. And we need to then make sure that our community colleges, where the high schools have them, that the community colleges are also having the further program, right? Um, because like my son is a welder and he learned to weld in a CTE program. 
I don't know where he got that idea. But um, he, he then went to the community college, and um, he'll finish his community college degree when he gets back. He just got back on Saturday, so now that he's back, he can finish that, because he was serving abroad in the military. But my point is that we need to make sure that we have the, we need to connect the dots now. Because we did the hard work of bringing back the um, career and technical education programs and making sure that we're inspiring the workforce for the future, but now we need to really capture and bring the carrots. I would bring carrots. I don't like a lot of sticks. I like more carrots because I think you get better results. And so if we start working with the Department of Education and we really start embedding into that, um, and then we also need to be at the Higher Education Coordinating Committee um, because we can't be one without the other. And so we need to really have communication. And the big thing that I would like you to take away is we get to decide who sits at the table. When you are the commissioner, you are in charge of an agency, and, and you set the place settings for the table. We can set the place settings to have the Department of Education there the Higher Education <coughs> Coordinating Committee, the small businesses, and the unions. It's all about and, it's not or. And for too long, we've only had one player at those tables. And it's really time for a change. OK, Lisa, here you go. So I appreciate hearing your, your vision kind of around apprenticeships. And I do want to do kind of a plug. Um, at our community college, we're seeing some of the most growth in those non-credit programs. Um, and brag, we've got 6,500 apprenticeship, apprenticeships at Mount Hood. So I'm intrigued in finding out what is it a policy issue, a regulation issue, or just a funding issue, why we can't expand more? So when I was speaking of the apprenticeships and why we can't have more, um, we have the lowest ratio on the West Coast. So if you want to be an apprentice, uh, uh, in an apprenticeship, you have to have three trained people to train two people. So you have to have three journeymen to two apprentices. If you want to be an ICU nurse, your patient ratio is lower. It's just one to one. It's a two to one, right? So. It, why is it so dangerous that we have to have more people? It also eliminates some of our smaller shops. Because if you don't have three people that can train, you can't have apprenticeships. And so it's, it's really just a, a numbers game um, that is really refining and, and stopping um, the flow of the apprenticeships. And so we have 600 people waiting right now to get in those apprenticeships. If we change the ratio, I asked, when I met with the electrical contractors, I asked them, can you take more? And they said, absolutely. So I think that we should at least have the same ratio that California and Washington have, which is one to one. I don't know why we would need three to two. Um, and I don't think that it hurts anybody's wages by opening those jobs up. Because um, that's the theory, is that you need to slow the the amount of people coming in, because if you flood it, the wages would go down. I don't see a danger of flooding anything at this point. I mean, we need to build 111,000 homes, so there's a lot to a lot to work with. Um, and I want to talk to you um, after about the 6,500, because that's really cool. So awesome work. Thank you for doing that. So Sherry, do you want to do a one-minute wrap-up? Sure. Um, so this is, in my opinion, the most important race on the ballot. Um, I could have run for any position. I, I did this by intention. I think this is the most important position on your ballot this year, um, even more than governor, because this is the place where we build our workforce. This is the place where we connect our children. This is the place where we bring up all of the failing education that has happened over the pandemic and make sure those kids are not left behind. It's a really tough run. It's a tough run because it's a difficult position. Um, you have to give civics lessons on what bully does every time you talk about it. Um, it is a position that is not as exciting as the other ones or understood. And so I really need your support 
Um, I need your support in putting yard signs up, uh, sharing social media posts, and donating um, to get my word out. Because if I don't get my word out, I can't win. Um, and we need to make sure that we have the labor force that Oregon needs for the next 50 years. And I want to be that leader to do that. I've shared my vision with you, and I hope I've earned your support and your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. That's so great. Thank you very much. So I want to thank again our sponsors, our presenting sponsors, Columbia Bank, Portland General Electric, Persimmon Country Club, The Boeing Company, and Gresham Barlow School District, and also Metro East Community Media. Again, if you'd like to hear what Sherry had to say or you need some clarification, the rebroadcast schedule is on uh, brochures or on the registration table, or you can check out the website when we load it. Ballots are in the mail. Yeah, supposed to be today. Oh, tomorrow, the ballots are supposed to be in the mail soon. <laughs> soon um, so be sure and uh, take a hold of your ballot keep it secure and vote um, and get the message out about who you are and you can check the website or our newsletter to see who the chamber suggests that has a business perspective on candidates um, we all have personal perspectives we all have all kinds of reasons why we vote the chamber is offering you offering you the business perspective and they've gone through a great job done a great job at selecting the candidates in fact Sherry didn't mention it, but Sherry is one of the candidates that your chamber has endorsed. So I want to thank you for that. So with that being said, don't forget to vote. Check out the newsletter. I've got all my notes written down. The last note I have is have a great rest of your day and go forth and make a profit. <laughs> Thanks for being here.